everyone. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me today. Um, can you guys all hear me? Does that sound good in the back? All right, good. All right, I'll start my timer. So it's 1 o'clock, so let's get started. Um, this session is Competing with Giants, How to Win with Drupal versus Proprietary Alternatives. Um, my name is Brian House. I'm Vice President of Product Marketing at Acquia. How many people get email from me? Excellent. You know how it is. So, um, so to objectives for this session. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about um, my experience personally and what we're seeing um, at Acquia and in general um, about the market opportunity for Drupal, um, the competitive, certainly the competitive landscape for Drupal, um, and where we're seeing Drupal compete and how it competes against um, some of the proprietary vendors in the market, how the analysts perceive, so how the Gartners, Foresters, Real Story Groups of the world perceive Drupal in comparison to some of these other vendors, um, and how you can think about positioning Drupal to win. You know, one of the things that we see day in and day out at Acquia when we're talking to large organizations that are considering Drupal is, you know, we as the, you know, as the vendor um, working with our partners can talk a lot about Drupal, but, you know, when an organization makes a big bet on Drupal, it's because there's internal champions that can articulate the story, that can tell them why um, Drupal is a better solution for their organization um, as compared to whatever those alternatives may be. And so a lot of what this we do in day in and day out is training people within our customers, our prospects, how to tell the Drupal story, how to position it with procurement, how to position it with their business stakeholders if they're on the IT side, or how to sell it to IT who's maybe resistant to open source um, or other pieces that make Drupal. And then the last thing I'll wrap on today is how you can help. Um, what's critical in this process of growing Drupal's market share, growing the opportunity for Drupal and winning is to share stories, to talk to the analysts, to tell your story loudly. That's the, probably the biggest driver of success and we see in sort of when peers share with one another. And so I'll have some ways that you can help and hopefully uh, that'll inspire you to reach out to us or reach out to uh, other folks directly. So <clears throat> how many of you um, would consider yourselves enterprise users of Drupal? Excellent, excellent. So you guys probably see all this day, you know, firsthand and know from firsthand experience. The landscape, the landscape is uh, definitely shifting as Drupal enters the enterprise. You know, perception in many ways is reality. This is a, a quote we came across um, from an Adobe lead sales engineer. And so thinking about how other vendors position themselves against Drupal is really, really critical. You know, the, the proprietary vendors of the world love to use FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt to position against us. They love to put us in boxes, um, you know, small sites, you know, open source, not ready for prime time, not ready for the enterprise. And they'll be very explicit about that when they talk amongst themselves and certainly when they talk to their prospects. And so providing the ammunition to you and to your counterparts with inside your organization is critical to combat this FUD. So when I think about the enterprise and sort of the perspective I'm using for this presentation, it's thinking about the global 10,000, which actually consists of about 14,000 businesses according to IDC, but global 10,000 has a nice ring to it. Um, but these are organizations that have more than 2,500 employees um, and have greater than $500 million in revenue. And what we see here is that when you're talking to organizations like this, they have well-defined procurement processes. They understand how to purchase technology. They purchase it a lot. There's a lot of stakeholders and decision influencers that you go through. Um, and so they've got this down pretty well down pat. Now there's typically technical stakeholders, and this, the, this group changes, but it's the CIO and the CTO are concerned about business transformation and sort of where do they lead their business to effectively achieve three things, improve top-line growth, reduce costs or improve customer satisfaction. And then there are the people that are operating and using the system on a day-to-day -day basis, the architects, sysadmins, the developers, DevOps teams. Um, you know, on the flip side, there's the business stakeholders. It's the CMO, the VP of marketing that own the websites, are responsible for the website and making the website work for their business. It's the VP of digital um, or e-marketing with an organization, as well as their department heads. And then finally, the people that use the system every day. You know, we have countless situations when we're bringing Drupal to a large organization where we've got the technical side of the house, they understand the architecture, they like what it does, um, 
they're bought off on it. And then we go over to the marketing department, the people that are going to use the system on a day-to-day -day basis. And they throw up all over Drupal. And they say, hey, I saw this sexy demo from, you know, insert your uh, proprietary set, uh, CMS system here. Um, and I want that to look like that. That looks really cool. That looks really easy. And so they can derail a process based on the demo. Um, there's a boff tomorrow about marketing Drupal, and this is a big piece of it. One of the things we need is a sexy demo. Um, we've seen the flip side happen too, right? Where you sell it into marketing, you talk about social publishing and all the things that Drupal can do, and then you take it over to the IT, and IT comes in and they don't know the LAMP stack. They're not ready for open source technologies. They're resistant because it's a change to how they do business, and we all know change is very, very difficult to manage. Um, and so, you know, you need to address both of these audiences when you're talking to, to sell Drupal, particularly in an enterprise environment because people aren't in, uh, empowered, in many cases, to make these decisions sort of on a one-off basis. But regardless of the uh, department, you know, and who the stakeholders are at the table during this process, you know, what we find is that what they're trying to accomplish, their objectives are oftentimes very, very much aligned. They want to publish and organize rich on content. They want to do it quickly. They want to get more out of their site. They want to have more social experiences to their site. Increasingly, they want to have more mobile experiences and have multi-channel publishing um, to create these rich experiences and push them out to multiple devices. More and more, they have collect managed collections of sites. There's not one or tight or ten sites. How many people here have more than ten Drupal sites that they manage in their organization? Thank you. My point exactly. This is becoming a real challenge. Um, and there's great opportunities for Drupal, but this is, you know, what organizations are trying to do. And then they need help building communities to support ad hoc business activities. And so Drupal provides a nice, flexible environment to do that. And so, you know, increasingly what we're seeing is, is how they're looking for solutions that bridge the gap between what marketing is trying to accomplish, creating great experiences, creating personalized experiences for visitors, managing digital assets and making more put their content to work, and then managing and measuring and tracking that with IT objectives, which is, you know, manage costs, manage the infrastructure, create content distribution so that way you can sort of get a standardized platform and get some benefits of leverage and scale when this thing they build so that way when you manage hundreds, tens, or hundreds of sites, you can do so cost effectively and then be able to integrate that into your existing infrastructure. There's lots of data systems, lots of sources that you need to tie to SSO, um, security systems, certainly CRM and marketing automation systems are top of mind with everybody. So, you know, the nice piece is that, you know, how do you position Drupal to help bridge this gap rather than reinforce the differences between these two? And so when we talk to organizations, and I'll talk about some of this in some of the case studies at the end, many look like this. They've got lots of disconnected sites, and more likely, they have lots of disconnected sites and lots of different technologies powering uh, their content on those sites. We talked to a large uh, pharmaceutical company recently. They have 600 websites, and they estimated they had 60 CMSs that they were managing somewhere in the world. You know, so internal teams, local teams, outside resources. I mean, this is incredible complexity for them as an organization. And what that translates into is costs and slow, you know, they, they're slows down their delivery to their business. And they're not able to deliver consistent experiences to the business as a result because they don't know who's to, who owns the technology, do they have the resources in that area to serve that business needs. And so what we're looking, you know, the challenge here is they see tremendous duplication of content and duplication of effort amongst their editorial teams that are trying to manage content across these. They've got lots of information in disparate sources. They can't connect all that. They can't take advantage of all these great knowledge assets, content assets that are exist in the organization because it's hard to push across these technologies. It's impossible to report on this. Um, and what they find is, yeah, there's maybe areas where we're doing really, really well, but they can't make it scale. They can't replicate this. This is one of the things we're hearing over and over again, is I want to experiment in my organization. I want to apply agile methods to our web properties because I know I have a lot of them. I want to try things, test, iterate on it, and then when it works, then roll it out across the organization. You can't do that when every technology under, underpinning this is different, and so you, you, know, you don't have any way to scale and repeat what works across your infrastructure. And so what we're increasingly hearing is what the business wants is something like this. They want a central repository. This could be one doc root. This could be many code bases. 
but where they can have content services model where they can push that out. They can push content out to multiple sites. They can reuse content across multiple sites. They also now can get to multiple uh, multi-channel delivery. So they can take those nodes and push them out to mobile devices. They can push them out to their marketing automation system to push to marketing campaigns. Um, they can push them out to social channels and re-get some scale and leverage across this. And so, you know, there's a new term we'll talk about here in a minute called web experience management um, or web engagement management. There's lots of ways to describe it. But this is ultimately the goal here is to create a central infrastructure that powers across many of your um, web properties. You know, and from an IT perspective, what we hear time and time again is this is the challenge. We have tens if not hundreds of websites. I want to be able to get some benefit and scale. You know, one of our customers um, is an organization, Florida Hospital. They have um, 150 websites behind the firewall. And they have some 80 websites outside the firewall. And so one of the benefits they saw in standardizing on Drupal was that they can get leverage from their theming and their design teams, from their development organizations, from their sysadmins and the DevOps teams that run the infrastructure. So now they can deliver websites as a service. So this is great for the IT organization. They can reduce costs. They can replicate best practices. They can create process to roll out sites very, very quickly um, and scale and, and still affect their bottom line. So now what they want to do is, of course, go back to this and be able to make that available across multiple channels. So it's not just the website, but it's actually being able to create you know, sites that work in mobile that communicate beyond just the properties that they drive their traffic to. Now what we're seeing is Drupal is uniquely positioned to do this and do this very well. Because Drupal addresses the broadest range of needs um, for site creation in the market. So this scale is the scale of the site, how much traffic, how much um, uh, uh, traffic does it get to the site, you know, how does it peak on the vertical axis versus the complexity and longevity of the site. How many systems are you integrating it with? How much you know, d custom development work do you need to meet your goals? And you know, there's lots of alternatives, and we'll talk about them, that can do the corporate site really well or can do very, very sophisticated editorial publishing very well, and you can create very sophisticated workflows. But you know what? To build a marketing site in those, very, very difficult to do. And when you need a marketing site next week, it's impossible to do. And so that's when they go outside and they hire an agency to bring in an external technology. That's when they go and experiment with something sort of off the grid um, from IT or from sort of where the systems teams manage, because they can't get it get done either way. You know, we have an organization that we talk to they needed mobile sites to, to, for the, some of their business stakeholders for promotional campaigns. And their core system was an Oracle Fatwire system. And so the business come in and said, hey, you know, I need a mobile site for this promotional campaign, but we're running it in two weeks. Can you do it? And you're like, well, to do a mobile site in a Fatwire is going to take us two months. We don't, you know, can you wait two months? Can you hold your campaign? Well, of course not. They can't hold their campaign. So then this is where, this is one of the ways that Drupal enters the organization. They're like, well, we can do it in Drupal in two weeks. How about, do you have any problem if we do it in Drupal? No, we don't have a problem with that. Guess what? Now they've got a Drupal site. And they've got a mobile site. And like, hey, that's really great, because we have three more of those. Can you do that again? And you can start to beat that, build that repeatable scale. And so you know, that's one of the things that Drupal is really, really well suited for. And the organizations that are open-minded about how they approach their web technologies and are embracing open source, that's what the things that they see. This agility and time to market becomes critical, but they're not sacrificing the web application framework to do the larger sites. They know that they can still b address some of their more complex requirements with this. And so for many, it's not simply a choice between open source options. Um, you know, this is a, a map I like to show from the Real Story Group. This is one of the analyst firms that covers the market. We're in a pretty complicated space, as it turns out. There's a lot of vendors in the content management space in one form or another. And so, uh, you know, Drupal's down here at the bottom, in the bottom right, uh, left-hand corner. But you see this, you know, when they think about content technologies, they think about documents and records, web content management, portals, collaboration and social software, and then SharePoint altogether. So, you know, it's hard to break through in this, in this, in the, in this, uh, in this ecosystem. But one of the things that's nice about Drupal is it meets uh, many of these different capabilities. But because it's an application framework and it's an open platform, in the areas that it's not going to excel, you're not going to use Drupal to do docker document management. You're not going to use Drupal to use records management. You can integrate with a system to do that. With, use CMIS. Use something like Canopy to integrate with Alfresco. Um, so it gives you a lot more flexibility when you're in this map. So you're not you don't have this technology sprawl, if you will. 
Now, when we think about the opportunity here, so there's lots of vendors. We also look at the opportunity, how big is this market? Um, so when we think about what, you know, where Drupal plays and sort of the roles it fits, it, it crosses the lines in a couple different places, but it certainly plays in the web uh, WCM, CMS market, which is a almost $2 billion market uh, in 2014. It plays in the social software market. Lots of people are doing uh, community websites with this, um, external communities, developer communities. It competes with the jives of the world. Um, that's a over a billion dollar market. And then certainly cloud-based, del cloud-delivered piece of this. And what's not represented here is commerce. You know, with Drupal Commerce, there's a whole other, much bigger market. And as Dries talked about yesterday in his keynote, you know, this doesn't really capture mobile either. Mobile's embedded in there because you're using these technologies, but really doesn't capture the real opportunity and the spend um, around this category. So this is an attractive market. This is growing. This is the web content's the fastest growing portion of the overall technology, content technologies market. And so it att attracts attention. Um, so what I mentioned before that the landscape is changing fast and open source really isn't the only option anymore. You know, open source, we talked in the, uh, in Dries's keynote video, we heard from people like the CTO of uh, Maxim Magazine and others that open source has reached parity, if not surpassing some of the proprietary technologies from a functional perspective. But at the same time, all these organizations are seeing the opportunity here and they're seeing the innovation and the pace of change is happening in Drupal, with WordPress, and with the open source market. And they're coming in and they're making acquisitions to go here. So Adobe's purchased in the last few years a day software, traditional web content management uh, company, Omniture. They've made purchased PhoneGap and a bunch of other small things. They've created a product suite, CQ5, and they've actually moved it out of Adobe over into the Omniture group. So now they're selling marketing solutions to marketers, uh, you know, people that buy Omniture for, in, for, uh, in traditional um, web analytics tools. So very much a CMO sale. Oracle a few years ago, uh, or actually just last year, purchased Fire, Fatwire, and then they recently purchased Indeca Software, an enterprise search company. So now they're putting those ten things together. They also, a few years ago, purchased Stellant Software. So we're starting to see Oracle um, in opportunities. HP, I mean, the last probably vendor you'd think would be in this, in this market, but they bought Autonomy, another powerful search tool. Autonomy had recently purchased Interwoven, so now they're in the web content management space and they're building cloud web content management solutions. So if you, as you see here, these are big companies. These are big companies with very, very large market caps, and they're all looking at the web and mobile um, as part of the web and this concept of web experience management to, in really attacking this market. You know, the vendor that, that of late that's keeping us up the most and me up the most personally is Salesforce. How many people are familiar with Site.com? A few hands. How many people use Salesforce here? Next time you log into Salesforce, you'll see an ad for Site.com right there. And so this is, you know, this is an interesting play here. This is, you know, they're, you know, they love the no software um, uh, mantra and it's worked well for CRM and they disrupted that space. But they're going to come in ha uh, hard to this market. And they claim they're the first cloud uh, CMS uh, product in the market as, as of late. And you know, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. This is why you hear things like Aqu from Aquia talking about things like OpenSaaS and OpenCloud, because it's a way to disrupt these uh, people like Salesforce and sort of change the landscape on them when competing with them in deals. So. Hopefully this gives you an idea at a high level of sort of what the market opportunity is and why the players are now coming in. So let's dig into a little bit to how the analysts perceive this market. So I'm going to walk through some of the magic quadrants and waves um, to give you an idea of sort of where people perceive Drupal as compared to some of these vendors. So this is uh, the 2011 WCM magic quadrant from Gartner. Are you guys familiar with magic quadrants and Forrester waves and all that? All right. So in this one, Drupal doesn't make the list. Now we see the oracles and autonomies, which is now HP and open text of the world. And so this is one, you know, I talk to uh, Mick McComska from uh, um, Gartner all the time. And so of course my, uh, my question to him is how do we get Drupal on this list? You know, we send him references um, from some of the largest Drupal users, people that are featured in the keynote video, some of the largest brands and, and organizations that you, you hear when you go to drupal.org and how they're using Drupal, but yet we still can't crack into this. And the piece is this, this, this is where the vendor dynamic becomes really, really important. 
because the analyst firms don't understand how to evaluate open source projects in the context of these market criteria they use. You know, the, a magic quadrant is completeness of vision, which is sort of a technical view of how well you address the needs of this market tied to ability to execute. And ability to execute is very much tied to vendor, vendor size, how big are you? And so it's skewed to a backwards looking view of vendors and skews to larger the vendor, the better uh, your ability to execute. The more likely you'll be there to take out risk from someone, a technology procurement process. You know, if, the, if you're a buyer, you're going to invest $100,000 or $250,000 or a million dollars, you're looking to mitigate risk with that purchase. And so that's really what this is a measure of on the vertical axis here. And so it's very, very difficult to, to break into this, particularly when, then, when they measure your um, minimum threshold in license revenue. So the minimum threshold to get into this magic quadrant is $10 million in licensed software revenue. So because it's open source, we don't have licensed software. So I know we get calls all the time when we're selling, well, where's Drupal in the magic quadrant? Do you have the magic quadrant or the wave that shows me you know, that I can go to take to procurement, that I can go take to legal, that I can go take to my CIO to validate the choice? You know, we've run two or three Drupal projects, or maybe we've run 10 or 12 Drupal sites. We understand how it works technically, but I need that third party validation that's to, in order to go get us to move from, you know, a $50,000 investment to Drupal into a $500,000 investment into Drupal. And so this is really, really hard. And they don't have a good answer for this, frankly. Um, so we badger them over and over again. And you'll see when I talk about how you can help, the most important thing you can do in competing against these vendors is to talk to the gardeners and the foresters. Tell your story and tell them why they need to be covering them in their market overviews. Foresters, uh, frankly, even worse. <laughs> So they, uh, again, Drupal doesn't make this list. It's a smaller list. One of the things that Forrester does is actually reduces, they're constantly trying to reduce the number of vendors that make their market analysis uh, evaluations because they, like, they want to keep it simple. So they'll tell you they have 100 people on the list, but you know, eight or 10 make it, and sometimes even five. And for them, the minimum threshold is $25 million in software license revenue. So again, we talked to, this is uh, Stephen Powers and Tim Walters. Um, you know, we talk to them a lot. They understand Drupal. We've introduced them to customers, um, people that are using um, uh, Drupal in a large way, whether they're an Acquia customer or not, frankly, um, to help them tell the story. But they're still skewed very much to legacy players, legacy vendors, um, and sort of, you know, this type of business model that they understand and can compare apples to apples, which is around software license revenue. The other thing that they talk about is they want interest from Forrester clients. So how many people here are uh, Forrester clients? Anyone? A couple hands. How many Gartner clients? Anyone? All right. So, you know, this is, this is key. If they're not getting phone calls about the technology from those of you that have subscriptions and, frankly, those of you that don't, or if you can see them at a conference and ask them about Drupal, you're, they, you know, they're hard to put you on the radar. They're, they, they're focused on what their customers and their clients are, t uh, are calling them about. And so we need more people. You know, they hear vendor pitches all the time. We talk to them about Drupal, um, you know, every few months. But until they hear it from their clients and get that pull from the market, they struggle with uh, making sure that we get into these kinds of lists. Now, Real Story Group's a little bit different. They, uh, they have these, uh, they don't really do market analysis. So relative position on this two by two wave matrix is uh, this not supposed to really have um, any value. So unlike the Forrester and Gartner ones, your goal is not to be upper right-hand quadrant, if you will. But they do these cross-checks to give you sort of relatively vi right, relative viability, which again, you can see what they're trying to measure. They say, what's the product maturity on the horizontal? What's the vendor maturity from, uh, um, on the bottom? And then what's the relative risk? And so last year when Drupal 7, when I did this presentation in Chicago, Drupal 7 had just been released. It had been out for two months. And so Drupal was way up higher on the risk scale because there weren't a lot of modules. It was a relatively new version of the platform. Um, so there was a lack of comfort. And the report had just come out after Drupal 7 was released. Now, Drupal 7 has been out for a year. It surpassed Drupal 6 in usage. It's coming back into the middle. If anywhere in this chart you want to be somewhere in the middle, um, but you don't want to be static, static. That would be bad. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, so the nice thing about uh, the Real Story group is of all the firms, they do the most technical due diligence of a product. What they do is they actually talk to 
practitioners. In fact, they don't talk to people like Acquia. They don't, they're not interested in talking to vendors at all. You have to sort of beg, borrow, and steal to get any analyst time with them to just talk about Drupal. But what they what, do want to do is they want, you, they want to talk to your clients. They want to talk to practitioners, and they'll go in. So if you, how many of you have ever read a Real Story Group report? Anyone? A few hands. I mean, they'll go in there very lengthy. They're 12, 15-page reports. They'll talk about the architecture, the user experience, the um, paradigms. I mean, they understand uh, you know, how Drupal works versus a page-based system. And frankly, they have pretty frank feedback. They understand what Drupal's shortcomings are, and they're pretty open about that. They also understand what Drupal's weaknesses are, and they undersell those, as you'd expect them to do as an analyst firm. But that at least gives you an idea if you're competing in your own organization or if you're selling to your clients and you know there's a competitor, they're pretty, they're pretty spot on, they, hit, they, they score Drupal pretty well, and they understand what's good and bad, so they have a very similar view of the competitive technologies. So if you're looking for how is Drupal going to compete against Sitecore or SDL Tridian or Fatwire or whatever the technology, I certainly encourage you to look at this. This is why we use this service and actually we get a tremendous amount of value from it. So now if we go over to the social software market, this was the, web, the WCM view. Something, see something a little bit different. We see a little bit more um, um, sort of forward thinking, at least from Gartner. So this is the social software in the workplace. So this is specific for social and community applications behind the firewall within an organization. So again, the, now the criteria here has lowered. It's decreased in terms of the amount of revenue, although the requirements for the number of active users and the number of organizations with large-scale active users is pretty large. You know, actually, Finding four organizations with 5,000 person intranets that are all active users on for, for, for Drupal is not the easiest thing in the world. How many people have intranets that big on Drupal or bigger? Nobody, uh, one person, I see one hand in the room. So, so we'll need to talk after the session. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that, you know, so, that, so this is a challenge, but the good news is there's a guy, uh, Nico Strakos, who's in uh, Portugal, and Jeffrey Mann, who's in uh, the Netherlands, are the two analysts that run the, they understand Drupal, they, they, they they see the value in the platform, and they're bullish on it. So they position Drupal as, a, as visionary here. Now you notice they say Drupal slash Acquia, and this goes back to the vendor issue. They don't understand open source projects. They don't understand how it fits in their construct. So they're looking for a vendor. And so that combination is what they, is what they end up putting in this report. And so when I fill, you know, there's these long questionnaires, like an RFP, it's got 500 questions. They're sort of ridiculous. Um, but when I do that for these, I tell them what we're evaluating is Drupal the project. It doesn't have anything to do with Acquia. When they, there's company questions, I fill it from an Acquia perspective because we can fill the role of the vendor in their mindset. And then they insist on putting that in there even though we ask them not to. Um, because frankly, it doesn't work, you know, work well. We want you, regardless of whether you're using Acquia as any of our products, we want you to be able to use this report. And again, provide it to procurement. Provide it to the people in your organization to build the business case for Drupal. Um, and if that um, having Acquia in this threatens that, then that's, you know, then we haven't achieved our objective. So we continue to push on them. Now for externally facing software, this is social software, these are external communities, developer communities, uh, customer support communities like the Symantec has built. Again, Drupal's in the visionary uh, category, but if an organization is using a magic quadrant to develop a short list, Drupal's number four. So that's actually a great position for us. You know, it's still early days to be a leader, and obviously they don't really believe anyone has established as a true leader in this market. But if you go and you say, who are the top five vendors in this? Drupal's number four, LifeRay's number five. So that's, you know, that's progress in the world of uh, industry analysts. Again, every year they increase the number of seats and users, although you know, now they're starting to adjust their criteria here, sp explicit to open source. But these are the, some of the thresholds and criteria why they, um, by which they evaluate different projects. Um, you'll notice that Microsoft and IBM, on the internal, behind the firewall, were leaders far and away. You know, this is SharePoint and the Lotus products. Now you go to external, they're barely, you know, they're laggards and they're falling behind this because they know people don't use those for external facing things. So tremendous opportunity here. Forrester, again, same thing as they did them before. They're trying to reduce the number of vendors out there. This is a little bit old. This is from 2010. They haven't updated this report. Um, but, you know, you see the criteria. And so, again, they, we talked to them. We told, tell them all about Drupal for external use, and they get it. But, you know, it's hard to make the vendors, um, make the waves. So that it's all about 
the questions for them and in, in, in increasing their visibility of who's using this in large-scale deployments. So when we talk to the analysts and when they write reports and they cover this market, how do they see Drupal? So from a strengths perspective, they, love, you know, they see the value of the community and then the features that come out of that. They're driving from a publishing perspective as well as a collaboration and community development perspective. Um, and they understand this concept, this meme that we created right when I first joined Aqua, of social publishing actually resonates with, with them. And, and so when we talk to them about how do we position Drupal um, in a particular opportunity, whether it's against Oracle or whether it's against Adobe, they always come back to the native social capabilities. That's the thing that Drupal has above all else um, that differentiates itself against those in that market. The fact that it's open and modular and has a lightweight core is good. It's nice for dynamic web applications, so you know, more and more people are building much more interactive and dynamic pages, and so obviously Drupal does that well. And there's this concept of placeless delivery. So I talked about the, the delivery push to mobile um, and other applications. This is going to be really important. But the other thing they say is they talk about how this is a significant paradigm shift for people um, in terms of how they evaluate web technologies. And so it seems native and sort of very intuitive to us, those of us who have been in the Drupal uh, community for a while, you know, this concept of having nodes and delivering them and putting them wherever and having sort of treating them as atomic elements is very easy. But, you know, uh, you know Adobe has a very much a page framework. All these legacy systems treat documents content on the web as documents and XML files and HTML files and they treat them and manage them as such and so they have a much more rivid, rigid infrastructure and because that's the legacy, making, introducing change there is difficult. From a weaknesses perspective, I don't think anybody in this room who has experienced with Drupal would be surprised by any of these. Configuration management, content staging, um, you know, the lack of sort of formal editorial approval processes. A lot has happened with Workbench and things that are for sort of more editorial process, but still that remains an issue here. And again, it's finally, it's too many enterprise success stories. You know, I put all the criteria from these various uh, analyst reports in here to give you an idea of the sense and scale they're looking for. And so there's just, there's great su success stories around Drupal, but we need more of them to convince this community to write about it in a way that becomes an asset for you to use so you can sell Drupal to your clients and within your organizations. So how do you impact analyst coverage? Share success stories. That's probably the most important thing you can do. Talk about your Drupal implementations. Um, if anybody wants to, you know, wants to geek out with the, the Real Story group, I'd be happy to make introductions so you can walk them through all the cool things that you've done. And showcase the innovation, the, you know, whether you've built cool mobile apps and they have responsive design or you're pushing content from a Drupal repository into a third party uh, store or into other applications. Those are the kinds of things that help us um, position Drupal in a way that it should be on their radar, in a way that they should be promoting Drupal to their clients that are asking these questions rather than being like, well, I don't really know what Drupal is, but you know, we hear about it a lot. And then ask the analysts about Drupal. This is probably the most important thing. Call them up, ask them, ask them about it, tell them they, you want to learn more, tell them they need to do more research, they haven't written it about it enough, because this is a critical piece to driving them to action. So, you know, Drupal, we know the success stories, it's becoming a first class citizen, but there's lots of room for improvement here. Drupal 7 is a huge uh, initiative and a huge effort and a step in the right direction here, and, and, and we're seeing a lot more recognition of that, particularly as it gets adopted but there's more we can do to position Drupal to win. So one of the things that we hear the most about is time to market. The ability, you know, Bob Kerner talked about it in the video yesterday in the keynote that, you know, they made a commitment to launch a site in 30 days and hit that commitment. You know, time to market is critical. We're talking to more and more organizations that are rolling out a site or more than one site per week. And so cost and speed to market are probably the two biggest issues. And it's interesting to see Accenture presenting this in sort of their innovation center for organizations that are focused on innovation, they can be achieve, open source enables them to do that faster um, and in, in much more cost effectively. And so this is where this concept of a shift from to content services is critical. You know, I mentioned it before, placeless delivery, from going from page-centric applications to these content services frameworks and being able to articulate what that means from your organization is critical. Um, certainly this open modular architecture is important it speeds rapid application development, but yet we all know that community module quality is, is variable, so you need to be able to, um, you know, 
the 15,000 modules or whatever the number is today is both a blessing and a curse when you talk about innovation within your organization. Some people love the fact that they get a starting point to achieve their objectives quickly. Other people are like, oh, wait a minute, that sounds like the paradox of choice. That's too much. How do I figure out what, what to use? I think we all live that. And then certainly this RESTful service is a way to deliver these services out to applications. And so this is a slide that we use to talk about, you know, explain the node concept to people that are unfamiliar with Drupal and how you can use nodes and assemble those together to create content types and then link those to other elements and then prevent, present views um, to aggregate and mash those up together to present your content delivery. And so, you know, this is very, very different from this page-centric model. And so, now it's a little bit sometimes hard to grasp for somebody who's coming from a legacy world, but at least it, it's a way for them to start to put this framework together. So this is a critical piece of this atomic approach to managing content, free of the sort of hierarchical, uh, hierarchical structure um, to content organizations and really empowering organizations to get more reuse of those sites. And we saw both on the IT and the marketing side getting more reuse of those content assets and putting those to work in applications is critical. And then having service level controls to distribute those, to use managed permissions on those is critical. And taking advantage of some of Drupal's uh, taxonomy capabilities is key. The same way is around you know, implicit and explicit personalization. Um, and how we organize and deliver content to visitors is key. You know, Drupal does the explicit personalization very well, where a visitor comes in, they mark their preferences in a profile or in some other field, and then we can deliver content to them dynamically based on those preferences. So this is something that Drupal does very, very well today. Um, and again, is, is interesting and certainly very, and is different from a lot of the legacy systems, um, and even some of the newer systems like f that you see from Salesforce. But now the next generation of this is personalization and doing this implicitly based on traffic behavior, based on GOIP, based on things that we know when you haven't filled out any profile forms, you haven't given us your explicit capabilities. And so this is something we think is really, really critical that Drupal can do very well, just needs, some, uh, um, needs investment to, to make that available as a service or a set of modules within um, the Drupal architecture because more and more marketers are trying to take advantage of this and then tie this into multivariate testing to make sure that they understand how do they get the more out of their websites. And so this content services delivery model is critical to Drupal's competitive advantage. This is probably one of the things that we think is, you know, the biggest, and I've talked about it a few times, I just want to reiterate. This is how we support placeless content delivery. Um, this is how we're going to build great mobile apps, how people are using the services module today to take advantage of this and really build amazing things with Drupal. So some, certainly something is you're positioning Drupal, it's critical to help your, uh, your counterparts understand um, when they're thinking about what, what is it that makes Drupal different? Why is it this system versus some other system that we feel more comfortable with? The second is the concept that we use that's really resonating a lot is this concept of assembled web experiences. This you know, ability to rapidly assemble websites very, very quickly from existing building blocks. It's a Lego uh, uh, analogy. We've moved it to a car analogy because Lego said we can't use Legos in our slides anymore. Um, but you know, this, this, is, this is nice. And actually what we're talking to organizations, so now it's when we think of solution distributions, we don't think of just open publish or commons or open public. Now we're talking to organizations that are saying, we want to create our own internal solution distribution. And so when we're rolling out sites, because we need to roll out 100 sites through our consumer products division, or you know, we need to roll out sites for all of our television shows at a major network. We want to create a solution distribution that allows us to do that internally. And so Drupal is uniquely able to, uh, en enable to allow you to do this, um, do this very, very quickly, and then roll out sites quickly. You know, one of the uh, um, stories I like to tell with this is the New York Stock Exchange has, you know, they have a number of teams that build websites, design, they have a product team, that works with the business and then they have development. And they've created sort of a, 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 a approved list of modules, if you will, to such an extent that now their products teams can configure modules, they've gone through a vetting process internally, can put a design in there and deliver it to the business without ever having any development work done at all. They don't write any custom code. It's just configuration um, and, and assembly of those modules. So if their key business criteria is to d uh, deploy sites faster. This speeds that time to market for them directly, uh, you know, dramatically. And so this is an important piece of their story. And so this is another area when we talk to someone who's not unfamiliar with Drupal, how um, 
this is something that starts to make sense, particularly with their IT teams, who are struggling to de uh, deploy sites quickly. And then finally, I talked about content-rich web experiences. This is the whole concept of social publishing and this, social, this meme we created, where on the right side of the equation, those are where we put the traditional content management vendors, the fat wires and Adobe's and CQ5's and Sitecores and Tridians of the world. On the left side here is the social publishing, or the social side. This is where the jives and mzingas are, the intelligence and lithiums are. And Drupal is unique in its ability to address all of these market needs in a single platform. And that's really, really critical. You know, for the organization that has 600 websites and 60 CMSs, having to come in and do, you know, get point solutions just to address a particular need only co adds complexity to their problem. It doesn't help them simplify. So, for, you know, as they think about standards, the more they can do from a single platform, the better. And so this is, this is really resonating. You know, when we initially drew this picture and sort of think about how to position Drupal, the other circle we had on here was application framework and talk to the ability to build custom apps. Um, we ended up not using it because it complicates the picture, but that's sort of the unspoken piece here is you get content, you get community, and you get a really powerful web app framework um, as part of that as well. You know, and then we all know that the Drupal community is large, it's very active, there's lots of people contributing code, but it, it's what this raises is it raises questions within these organizations on how does open source development really work? You know, certainly people always ask, and the other vendors that when you're selling against them, Drupal against whatever solution it is, these are the questions that they put in their champions' minds to ask, um, to raise FUD around them. Who owns the code? You know, we all know the answer to that, but how do I know what will be updated and how do I know that process will be updated? What does that look like if I invest in a particular set of functionality, you know, will that, what does that mean for major upgrades as well as for minor upgrades? And who pays for the development of new features? You know, this is one we had a, an interesting sales cycle where we spent a lot of time on these last three questions. Um, you know, who pays for the development? Do I have to contribute custom code back if we write a module that meets our needs? If, you know, do I have to commit it back? And then what's the benefit for that? And so we spent a lot of time walking them through this process that, you know, who pays for development and new features in the in an open source world? frankly, is no different than who pays for it in a proprietary world. It's just how you pay is different. You pay for it when you're buying from Oracle by paying for licenses, or buying from Sitecore by buying licenses for that software. Um, you know, in our world, you pay for it by buying, you know, paying for the development of those custom modules or features. Now, the difference here, and the, distance, the reason this model works better, is if you can contribute that back, more people will use it. So you don't have to bear the sole cost of that custom development work. You don't have to carry that alone. You know, if you're building some great new capability, whether it's an integration with a marketing automation system, it's an integration with a digital asset management system, or some new capability on your site, if that has legs, other people can use that and benefit, then by contributing back, they can contribute code to it. So now you've shared the burden of maintaining that code with one other firm, five other firms, ten other firms, or hundreds of other firms. And so, you know, having examples of this ready, whether it's, you know, Views that was de developed by Sony Music or um, some of the other modules that are, that are popular in the Drupal world and how they were started and how they've evolved over time by being contributed back to the community is critical in helping them understand that, frankly, it's not a lot different than what it is in the proprietary world. You know, I worked at a company, um, Documentum, that had a web content management project. And we were selling it when we had half an engineer. So, eng you know, when every new feature that we wanted and we sold in a project was based on our ability to close that deal for license revenue, you know, because otherwise we couldn't fund the engineering. I mean, is that really that much different than what we're talking about here? But now, instead of, you know, making that a, a opaque process for the buyer who's buying that software, now it's a very explicit process. If you pay for it, you can contribute it back, and you get the benefits of that in these ways. And you need to tell your story on why it's important for your organization and how others can use it so you can foster collaboration and contribution in that module. So that was, that's a really important piece, but in, it still happens almost all, every time we talk to a large enterprise, particularly ones that are unfamiliar or new to open source. So quickly, I was just going to talk through a couple case studies um, before we open up for questions. So I talked about the New York Stock Exchange. They have uh, 60 websites. You know, the interesting thing about the Stock Exchange is they were in a two-year project with a proprietary system. They spent more than eight figures on that system, and they ended up killing it because they had sort of a waterfall approach, 
and it was by the time they got to the end of that two-year project, all the requirements from the business had changed. And so they ended up killing that project and shifted to Drupal because they needed to focus on more agility and time to market, as I mentioned. Um, and because it was open, it had an, a thriving community, they could evaluate it from a security perspective. Security was obviously very important for them. Um, and then also the participation in the community. And so they made a, a you know, he, Bob Kerner, who's the chief digital officer there, talks about how they made a bet to deploy their first site in 30 days. This is the site, and they hit their target. Now they can't just deploy sites fast enough. In fact, he tells stories now where they, uh, there was a situation once where they delivered a site like a day or two, or two days early to the business. And the business says, no, no, you can't have it back. Don't shut it off. We'll get all the content in. We'll be done in two hours. You know, because so, there's so much pent up demand within this organization for new sites and these new capabilities that Drupal brings to them. So they've moved all of their new site. Um, this is their uh, corporate headquarters. So this is the, the pseudo homepage. The, they still have their old homepage up, but eventually they're going to shift to this. They've got new, uh, and then they've got Drupal sites for all of their global exchanges as well. So this is uh, the Belgian um, exchange, I think. Um, so you know, they are, you know, for an organization where time to market is critical, but they still have security and enterprise level concerns, this has been a huge success for them. Um, and they're rolling out, rolling out sites very quickly. I mentioned a pharmaceutical company. They have hundreds of websites, dozens of CMSs. Um, they were using and experimenting with Drupal in one of their divisions. And it started having success, and they had, this is the mobile story. They were able to deliver mobile sites and other sites very, very quickly, faster than they could with their other systems. And primarily, it was an Oracle shop. But this is a place where they were consume, considering Drupal against Oracle, sort of big enterprise, Salesforce, or this SaaS play, and then .NET Nuke, because they'd used .NET Nuke in some of the divisions around the globe, and sort of, those were the ones that had the, the, either the most to offer or had the biggest penetration. And so they, the good news is they selected Drupal as their web platform. And frankly, this ability to have SaaS options and cloud options for Drupal as well as internal options was a big piece of this. It was a way to shift the competitive landscape against Oracle. Um, and then the fact that they were able to build sites very, very quickly um, is the other, was the other big piece. And so they can deliver business sites to the, uh, to the business faster. In fact, they fig have figured out that they can build a site in half the time that it goes through their internal QA review process to launch it. So that takes twice as long than for them to actually build the website. And so now what they're doing is negotiating with them. So like, okay, let's create a standard framework to build a site so that way you don't have to go through the same review process. It, nothing's changed from a security QA perspective so we can shorten that time because now that's become the, bat, the, the delay in the process, not the actual development work. This is an example. Um, uh, of, a, of a public sector organization, Multnomah County in Oregon. This was a vignette shop. Um, so they had vignette, they you know, had a platform that was difficult to use. The issue, the biggest issue, and this is the funny thing I mentioned before about training and sort of the sizzle demo from, uh, from vendors. In actuality, a lot of the proprietary systems are much more difficult to use, much more cumbersome, require much more end user training but you just don't see it in the, on the videos that they put on their website and in what they do in their sales demos. And then everything that they wanted to do on their site required extra costs, extra products, so that they wanted to do things like image resizing or media handling or add document management that had additional license costs. So it was like this unending source of costs for them. And upgrading sites took a year. So they piloted Drupal. They were able to extend their feature set across their sites. Um, and create a repeatable platform for turnkey site launches, so now they can roll out sites according to uh, pre-established templates right out of the gate. Um, and nice piece here is not only did they reduce costs, but they actually saw significant increases in performance and site uptime. Um, so now they got a better performing platform and save money at the same time, and they reduced their training costs dramatically. So these are the kinds of organizations. Drupal is winning against these larger platforms in smaller organizations like this and in some of the largest um, global companies in the world, which is great news. Um, and these are the stories we need to tell uh, more generally. So you know, when we talk about Drupal to large organizations, we certainly talk about more capabilities, the fact that you can do more with Drupal. Um, it has a flexible architecture, so you have a, you know, can create assembled, this assembled web concept. You can add modules very, very quickly. It's a powerful application development platform, so you can build custom apps. And you can go to market faster. Now, you'll notice here that the last thing in the market is better value. So, you know, the, the, the dirty little secret of open source is it's neither free as in beer, 
nor free as in speech. It's actually just really free as in puppies, right? And so, you know, and, and vendors use that against us. Oh, come on, you don't know the costs associated with open source are crazy. You know, you don't know what you're getting into. Beware. When, at least when you buy licenses, there will be no other costs. Ha, 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 is what they say. Um, but, you know, this is the one to be, to, to be, to be the, probably the most careful about. And to, it's the thing that we have to be honest with ourselves when, when positioning Drupal in the enterprise to say, look, this isn't free. This is going to have costs. But your implementation costs are going to go down. Your deployment costs are going to go down. Overall, you're going to save money. And let's, you know, let's figure out a way that we can demonstrate that rather than say, hey, it's free license. So, you know, it goes right to the bottom line because that often isn't the case. So how you can help? As I mentioned, there's lots of reports. I showed a bunch of them from Gartner, from Forrester. Um, they're looking for global 2,000 organizations with more than 1,000 employees, greater than a billion dollars in revenue, uh, communities that have very, very large active user bases, internal or external communities. If your organization looks like this, please come talk to me about how you can talk to these organizations or talk to them directly. Because this is how we make sure Drupal gets up on the landscape gets into the, their visibility, and they start talking about it. And it's not because Drupal doesn't need to win. You're all uh, examples of success stories. Drupal, does, this isn't necessary to win, but it helps streamline the process. It'll help your conversations with your procurement. It'll help your conversations with your clients. If you have that third-party validation that says, see, I'm telling you what a great platform is, and Gartner, and Forrester, and the Real Story Group, or whoever the analyst firm is, agree with me. And they, here's backing up what I'm saying, so I'm just not out on a limb. It helps, it helps you reduce your risk in whatever sales process you have. Um, additional folks, we have Real Story Group, um, eConsultancy in the UK, another firm. Um, there's a few or smaller ones. IDC sort of covers this space, although they don't write much. Altimeter Group covers it from a, uh, a, a software, community software perspective. Anything you can do to go out and reach out to those folks, I'm certainly help, uh, happy to help facilitate that to spread this story, um, just please let me know. And I certainly encourage you to do that. So with that, I'm done. So thank you. So I'm happy to take any questions. Um, there's a mic, so ask him at the mic. Hey, Brian, uh, great Nate. speech. Uh, Nate Wolfson from Digital Bungalow in Boston. My question is, um, I think one of the unique challenges that you didn't talk about from a sales and marketing perspective um, is just knowing what else is happening in the Drupal community. How would you advise us if we're in a competitive pitch against, say, Sitecore and Adobe on how to know what the other success stories are that we can point to? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, this is one of the reasons we created um, the site Drupal Showcase was to provide a tool that anyone can use um, to find additional proof points in particular vertical markets. So you can go in there and search pharmaceuticals and find lots of pharmaceutical companies and websites built in Drupal. You can go in and search fin financial services. And it's a way, you know, intended to be a resource that it, so that way it doesn't matter what market you're selling into, what size organization, there's proof points that you can point to. There's, you know, we talk about a million and a half websites built in Drupal you know, what I want to be able to do is have a filtered, navigable uh, resource for me that I can go use those to sell Drupal to my clients. So that's one of the biggest things. You'll notice Acquia builds it. It's on Drupal Gardens, but there's no Acquia branding on it at all. We don't want to, you know, the purpose of it is, is actually not to introduce Acquia into that piece, but it allows you to use it as a Drupal resource. And you can, anyone can submit sites to it. And if you're a Drupal shop, and, you've, and you, there's a site on there that you built, just send us an email, there's a form on it, and we'll be happy to give credit. And so we want to we do that as well. So that's one way to do it. And then also, you know, the, between the case studies there and Drupal.org and sort of your peer communities, find references. You know, this is something that our sales team does constantly. Who else that looks like this, whatever this is, um, is using Drupal, and can we introduce to someone who's considering it? Hey, I'm Steve Strong with AppGo Worldwide. What if our clients uh, meet the criteria of the analysts and you know we're building these sites for them? How can we encourage them to reach out and share those stories? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, you know, certainly if they're if they're clients of these uh, of the firms, you know, I think it's 
it, it, you know, there's, you can ask them to do that. But I think what you have to do is present it to the, what's the benefit for them? And, you know, I tell them all, I tell people all the time that all these interviews and conversations with analysts are on background. You don't have to do a public case study that Gartner, because, you know, a lot of organizations shy away from that. But, you know, can you take a 15-minute call or a 30-minute call? Or would you respond to an email survey? When you do, like, Magic Quadrants for Gartner, um, we submit references to them, and then they send them a survey via email. So, you know, would they be willing to do that all on background? Nothing will be used publicly that's about their site um, to participate. And the benefit is, 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 again, these are assets that they can use to justify continued investment in your firm as a client, to justify greater investment in Drupal as a platform, um, or potentially even get it into in a situation where they're making a platform decision. This is what happened at the pharmaceuticals company. You know, honestly, it's, it was somebody that looks like all of us in the room, young person, he's probably 28, 29, and he just had a passion for Drupal. And so he started advocating within this global company, we need to do this, I can do this faster, and then delivered on it. Hey, here's a website. You said you need it in two weeks, here's two weeks. Um, and he convinced his boss, and his boss is boss, and so that rolled up to the you know, head of marketing IT systems within this global company. And it's interesting to sit in the room where he's there, and you know, Acquia is there you know, talking about how we can help them to make this technical selection for Drupal, and we let him do all the talking, because he's the credible one in the resource. We're just the vendor. We can just show you all the stuff that maybe he doesn't, hasn't seen or isn't available walking through their 20-point you know, demo script, if you will. Um, None of those other people in the room are technology savvy. They don't know open source. They, you know, they're business people that are trying to make that decision. So the benefit for that person um, is here you give them more third-party validation. So you're not as exposed in your organization, right? There's that whole mantra that if you buy Big Blue, you know, you'll never get fired. You know, I think Drupal's still in that phase where if you buy Drupal and it doesn't go well, you know, there's risk there. <laughs> you may or may not get fired. So, you know, having that validation for those for the champions that really believe in it helps to reduce their own personal risk. Any other questions? Well, great, everyone. Thank you for attending. <laughs>